morning everybody good to see everyone that's here with me worshiping today and welcome to all of you out in cyberspace uh, this is Stony Creek United Methodist Church we're in Ypsilanti but we maybe are reaching even greater horizons through Facebook so thank you for coming uh, now that we've done our welcoming, um, a couple announcements that I have, and then I'll turn them over to anybody else. It's not too late if you want to support the Thanksgiving ministry that the Outreach Committee is working and collecting money for, for the uh, Bishop Schools. Um, and then there's also a flyer. I see Pastor here, so he'll bring it up also. There's going to be an Advent study. Uh, thanking Grace is my middle name sometimes. Um, one of the ways that all of you could help with the Thanksgiving, if you came in the front door, you're going to notice a lot of big packages from Amazon. Amazon got them to the front. A couple of the men got them inside. And if you would consider maybe carrying them from there down to where we assemble everything, then we can get started on putting the bags together. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. Um, any other announcements of what's coming up this week? Any special choir musics or anything? 
I do have an announcement because since Thanksgiving is coming, that means Advent is coming, and wanted to you to make, be aware that for Advent decoration, you are all invited. And we're not doing the tree and other decorations Thanksgiving weekend. Instead, we're going to be assembling the tree on Saturday morning, December 2nd. So come for treats. I'm providing treats. And then we will put the tree up between 10 and 12 noon. And we'll put Rich on the ladder so you don't have to risk your health. But if you can come help undo branches and unfurl the branches, we have a beautiful artificial tree, but it takes some love and care to put it up. So we're doing that on Saturday, December 2nd at 10 a.m. And then the following day, because this way the kids don't have to wait for the tree to go up, and what we're doing on Sunday after worship on the 3rd, we're going to have light sandwiches and snacks for uh, what I'll call an enhanced fellowship time. So bigger snacks after fellowship on the 3rd, and then we're going to finish putting ornaments on the tree. So I know the, the kids will enjoy that, so I will get with Sarah and Kristen so that we can let all the kids know we're going to decorate the tree after church on the 3rd. And this is our first announcement, so I just wanted to put it out there, and then I will bring, if helpful, a sign-up sheet reminder next week, and that's what we have planned for the first weekend in December. If you didn't catch those dates, December 2nd, which is a Saturday, you can come over and help to take the tree branches out of the box and we'll get them ready. And then on Sunday, we will have the tree up and we'll have the kids help us decorate it. So that was uh, Saturday the 2nd and December the 3rd. Um, at this point, oh, someone else has an announcement? Okay. Next Sunday, the 19th, um, I'm almost ready to turn 80, so we're going to have a little birthday party with a lunch and cake and whatever. Um, so right after church, if you see that somebody isn't here that usually comes, please tell them to come. We have lots of food, and I want to celebrate. No gifts. We're just going to have some fun and eat, eat, eat like Methodists do. Okay? Right. If there's nothing Methodists like to do more, it's snack and eat. Thank you very much. At this point, the pastor hasn't arrived yet, yeah, according sure. to this. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa and the praise band. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fonda. So please go ahead and pull out. Today you'll need the small black hymnal, soft cover black hymnal, we're singing 2087. And if you uh, think the uh, tune is familiar, Tammy just included it as part of her prelude music. So we will stand together for the first song that you'll find in the black hymnal, 2087. And then the, for the second song, you'll find it in the red folder and we'll be seated for the second song. But stand with us if you're able. Otherwise, go ahead and sing out from your location. We will glorify the King of Kings.
Jesus Christ, you have conquered death. Baptized in him, we are raised to new life. Increase in us our faith and keep us watchful that we may welcome Christ with joy when he comes to set the whole world free. Amen. Freely we have received, freely we give. With gratitude and joy, we will now collect our offering. Please rise as you are able and join in our doxology on page 95 in the Red Hymnal. Gracious God, receive our gifts, tokens of thanks for your extravagant blessings, signs of trust in your coming reign of justice, peace, and love. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You please be seated. <coughs> uh, one other announcement I wanted to mention. Um, if you didn't grab one of these when you were getting your bulletin, there are a stack of them out by where the bulletins are. This is a flyer about an upcoming Advent Bible study I will be leading using a book called Holy Disruption, Discovering Advent in the Gospel of Mark. Um, it's going to be online through Google Meet, which is a lot like Zoom, just different platform, but it plays the same way. You don't have to know anything. Um, you can get the book from Amazon or Cokesbury um, or anywhere else if you want to peruse, but there's links for both of those. Um, and they're going to be Wednesday mornings and Wednesday nights. The morning and night will be the same, but that way if you work during the day, you can do the night one. Or if 
you go to bed early, you can do the earlier one, whatever works best for you. It's four weeks, we'll be done before Christmas, so um, if you have any questions, uh, my contact info's on there, just let me know and I will tell you more about it, so. But if I could ask for any of our children and youth to come hang out with me for a few minutes and remember, you are all children of God, so everyone is welcome to come forward. And if you want a sucker, you definitely have to come forward. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sit there. All right. How you guys doing? Good. Everybody awake? Uh, I was playing video games all night. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was playing videos all night, though. All right. So today... We're going to learn some more about Jacob and Esau. Do you remember when I told you about them last week? And their twins. Uh-huh, their brothers. And one of them has red hair and one has black hair. That's right. And one of them hides and one of them likes stuff. Yeah. All right, they were listening last week. And, uh, the, and Jacob was, like, giving up something. Yeah, yeah hold on. We'll get, back, we'll get to that. I'm going to start having you guys teach this. Yep. All right, so, just like you said, Esau liked to go out and hunt with his dad. And, food. and yep, we got food coming here from the other brother, Jacob. All right, so Jacob and Esau got older. Isaac and Rebekah got older too. Isaac thought, I'm an old man. It is time to give my blessing to Esau. Esau, please hunt and make me my favorite food. Then I will give you my blessing. Esau left in search of food. But Rebekah heard Isaac, and she wanted Jacob to have the blessing. So she helped Jacob dress in a disguise so Isaac would think that Jacob was Esau. Rebekah made Isaac's favorite stew and gave it to Jacob to take to Isaac. Jacob went to Isaac's tent. Who are you? Isaac asked. It's me, Esau, said Jacob. Here is your food. Isaac ate his food and then prayed a blessing over Jacob. Then Esau returned to Isaac only to discover that Isaac had given the blessing to Jacob. Esau was very angry. So I got to ask, what would you have done if you were Rebecca? Would you have, would you have, put him in disguise and help him to steal the blessing? Or would you have let Esau get the blessing? Or maybe something different? I would just let him do his thing. You would have let Esau go ahead and get the blessing instead? Well, yeah, because he deserves more. Okay. Because I mean, Jacob's me, honestly. He's a little bit of a trickster, yeah. What about you? Do you think you would have done the same thing? Or you think you would have helped... Help Jacob instead. I do want to find what, but I think I would have to do um, the disguise. You do the disguise, yeah. What about you? What do you think you would have done? Um, so if I were the mother, I'd definitely try to get them to work together so they both get the blessing. Get them to work together. They were twins after all, and and Esau was like three seconds older than, than Jacob. That's really not a big difference. So, all right, let's see. How do you think Jacob and Esau were different? One has red hair, one has black. Okay, what else? One goes out to hunt and one stays in. That's right, Esau liked to hunt, Jacob liked to stay in. How do you think they're the same, though? Twins, but honestly, maybe they can like work together while like Esau can get a hunt for the food, and like uh, Jacob could like wait until Esau comes, and like, they could like cook together and hunt together, so that they can cook together. Interesting. What were you gonna say? I, I was probably gonna say the same thing as him. Like them, they could just work together. Like I mean, they're twins, but they don't have to work together. But. It'd be really interesting to see them work together because they've been having a lot of rivalry, like rivalry, rivalry, I should say. Rivalry, you know, I, I got you. It would be interesting what would have happened if Esau had, had hunted the, 
the, for the meat and Jacob had prepared it and they worked together. But we'll never know. We'll know until 2024. No, we won't know until it's all over. All right, so can you guys do a repeat after me prayer with me? Uh, we already know it. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. Uh, no. Not the Lord's Prayer. Different one. Okay. God. God. Thank you. Thank you. For being with us. For being with us. No matter what. No matter what. Amen. Amen. Okay, now what do we have to do? Lord's Prayer. That's right, the Lord's Prayer. Are you ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. If you want a sucker, you can have one. And then I think it's time for Kids Club and Sunday School. Go for it. Uh, two's enough. DeAndre. All right. If you hear a commotion later, it's just Rich beating me for not taking good care of the audio equipment. And I had it coming. All right, if the rest of you would rise as you are able and join together in singing our next hymn, number 191 in the red hymnal, Jesus Loves Me. be seated. Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that weigh upon our hearts and our minds as well as those that give us cause for celebration. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? I just wanted to give everyone an update on our visitation ministry. Um, over the past couple weeks, um, I've spoken with Tom Seibert over the phone. He seems like he's doing well. Um, he still says he's coming back to sit in church with us all, but um, keep Tom in your prayers. Um, a week before last, Pastor and I visited Mitch Fondrich, who is in the same lo uh, facility that Virginia Davis was in. And Midge is doing well, but she really, really misses Virginia. 
So she said Virginia was pretty much running that place. And she said she kept everybody in line, and she's just really missing her. Um, and if any of you want any information about how to get a hold of any of these um, people that were visiting, either check with Pastor or myself. Um, and then last week, we visited Jim Potter at his home. And Jim is still Jim. I mean, he's, I think, what do you say, 90, almost 92? No, Midge is almost 92. Yeah, he's 94? He's nine, I 95? can't remember, but you would recognize Jim if you saw him. He looks the same. Um, yeah, he's, he's doing pretty good. And then next week, I've checked on Laura Wilson. As I know some of you know, she moved over to Linden Square, where Oma is. But Laurel is in the memory care unit. So I checked with them, and um, I guess, Pastor, we can just show up there. They said, okay. you don't have to call, because she doesn't have a phone, I understand. So I'm hoping that this week we'll visit with Laurel. Um, I think that's it. Yep, that's it. I have a joy. It's coming. I practiced and practiced and practiced so I wouldn't get emotional. This Tuesday, Tammy and I will have been married 36 years. Uh, we don't, haven't been saying much about the uh, well, we got somebody who wants to talk. You can just use the. Who's you got a microphone up there? Um, one of the things I found interesting as we sang Jesus Loves Me, which was one that a lot of us probably learned, but I read further and if you're Cherokee, you could sing it. In Cherokee, they printed it in German. It's also in Japanese and Spanish. So to me, that was kind of indicative that Jesus loves all the children. They may not look like us. They may not always worship like us, but we're all children of God. I bring greetings from Beth Berry. Spoke to her just this morning. Her surgery Thursday went well. She's been able to control her pain with just Tylenol. And she thinks that by Tuesday, she's going to be ready to go grocery shopping again. So, and I also want us to remember um, Joyce Hennon is progressing well. Uh, I've been her care bear caregiver and taking her up to visit with Linda, who is still in rehab and will be going through some more tests. So there's a kind of an update on three of my little care bears. Thank you. What I started to say here just a minute ago was, uh, we do have these attendance books that are in the pews. Supposedly there's supposed to be one at the end that are like this. We'd like to do a little better job on getting them filled in so we know actually who was here and when. We haven't been saying anything about it, but uh, I think someone that used to pick them up is back now. That's my job. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, if you could, uh, it'd be nice to know uh, who was here and members, whether they were here or non-members. We'd, we'd like to get more members, of course. So please use those booklets to uh, let us know how we're doing. Thank you. And if anybody becomes famous, then we have an autograph. All right. I would also like just to add, um, I guess it could fall under both joys and concerns. Just thanks for all of our veterans who have served to help keep us safe over the history of our country and as well as those who are still serving 
today and for the sacrifices they have made. If you would please turn to hymn number 349 in the red hymnal for our invitation to prayer, turn your eyes upon Jesus. In our prayers this morning, I invite you, when you hear me say, Eternal God, to reply with the words, Hear our prayer. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Eternal God, hear our prayer. God of life, you created the world and called it good. In Jesus Christ, you came to redeem us. His resurrection is our promise of eternal life. By the power of your Spirit, you claim us, strengthen us, and prepare us to live with you in glory. In sure and certain hope, we pray for your world that we may live into your coming reign of justice and peace. For the church, wherever it thrives and wherever it, wherever it struggles, keep us faithful to your gospel. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For those who govern, grant them wisdom and a commitment to justice and mercy. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For planet Earth, heal its wounds and make us better stewards of its wonders and gifts. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For those who are dying, calm all fears and welcome them into your peace. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For all who suffer from anxieties and ills, give them relief. We especially lift up Laurel and Bev and Midge as well as all those who are still mourning today the loss of those they love. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For those who endure the days and nights without food or shelter, feed and protect them. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For those who suffer in silence, comfort those who carry secret sorrows. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For those who are suffering physically, emotionally, or mentally, whose names we have already lifted, may, your, may relief and healing come to them. Eternal God, hear our prayer. For all who seek your face here and everywhere in the world, eternal God, hear our prayer. For the many joys that we celebrate this day, including connecting with those that we maybe have not seen as recently as we would like, including Tom and Jim. We give thanks for 36 years of marriage for Tammy and Doug and your centering of their lives in their marriage. We give you thanks for showing your love for all the children of the world and acknowledging and claiming us as your children. We give thanks that Joyce has been able to go and visit with Linda and we give thanks for the sacrifice of all of our veterans and those who continue to serve to do their best to keep us safe in a world that is all too often full of violence and war. Eternal God, hear our prayer. With thanks that you hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, we entrust all of life to you, gracious God, our Alpha and Omega, our only hope in life and in death, through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. If you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us your promises that we might hear your truth and enjoy you in forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
if you're following along, I am not using the Pew Bible. I'm using a children's edition. Uh, and we're going to listen this morning to Psalm 43. Declare me innocent, O God. Defend me against those ungodly people. Rescue me from these unjust liars. For you are God, my only safe haven. Why have you tossed me aside? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Send out your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them lead me to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my harp, O oh God, O oh God. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. this time, I invite you to stand, if you are able, turn to page 339 in our red hymnal, and sing together, Come, Sinners, to the Gospel Feast. Please be seated. Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians. Say that one 10 times fast. Uh, you can find this reading on page 1171 in the Bibles in the pews. We are in the fourth chapter looking at verses 13 through 18. This section of text often carries the header, Believers Who Have Died. 
Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. Comforting and healing God, you walk with us every step of our lives during our time here on your beautiful earth. You have lived our pain, endured suffering at our hands, and paid the ultimate price for our salvation, death on a cross. And death is a constant reality in our lives, whether physical death, death of relationships, death of realities, death of histories, or any other kind of death. We struggle with death in whatever way it happens, and we grieve and mourn. But in these moments and times of grief and mourning, we know you also still walk beside us. Help us to feel your presence, to accept your love and grace, and to be comforted by the power of your Holy Spirit. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place, be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On this beautiful day that God has made, I pray that it is well with your soul and you will always remember that you are made in the image of God and therefore are beautiful just the way you are. Today we are continuing into our second week of our November sermon series, The Good News About Death. And that again will carry us through the last Sunday of November, Reign of Christ Sunday. Now we began this series last week on All Saints Sunday as we celebrated those who have left this world and moved on into perfection in God's grace and into those places that God is preparing for each and every one of us. And using a passage from the book of Revelation, which again, it's a book not often thought of as offering comfort or hope, we did find a verse or several verses that helped us talk about how it gives us meaning and a message of a new beginning that awaits and that Christ alone has the final word over life and death. Death is something we often struggle with in our world, whether it's dealing with the loss of someone we love or even in trying to support someone around us in our lives who have lost a loved one. We struggle to put into words what we need when we are grieving, and, and we often struggle to find words of comfort when someone else is struggling in their mourning. And I think a big part of that, or reason for that, is because we know deep down, even if we don't always want to admit it or talk about it, but we know deep down there's still this great deal of mystery around death, and there's very little that we can control within it. And we're humans, we don't like not being in control, or at least thinking we're in control. But it is my sincerest hope that this series might allow us to speak more openly about death and the Christian hope of resurrection. I also hope that it maybe allows us to kind of dispel and clear up some of our society's misguided notions around death. So as we continue on, our message this morning is titled, Grieving with Hope. Now, throughout my life, more so since being in ministry, I've heard a saying over and over again that I want to share with all of you, and I'm going to guess many of you have heard this one as well. And I've also heard different variations on it, but essentially the same saying. And I've heard it from a very wide variety of people in terms of what they do for a living or where they are in their life. 
Um, I've heard this from a fellow pastor. I've heard it from uh, a family uh, medical doctor. I've heard this from a funeral director, a psychologist, and even an art teacher once. And the saying is, the mortality rate for human beings is hovering at right around 100%. And given of all the different people I've heard this from, I'm not always sure sometimes if I should be surprised by some to expect it from others or possibly disturbed by whose mouths it comes from. But the real truth is that death is, in fact, the great equalizer. Irrespective of one's vocation, wealth, social status, class, or creed, death comes for us all. I've also heard the saying from countless people in my life that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Exactly. You all get an A for the day. However, having grown up in Chicago and knowing the history of certain people, including Al Capone, I don't know that you can really say taxes are inevitable, or at least there's ways around them. So maybe death is really the only certainty in life. But with this all in mind, the certainty of death, this inevitability of death, what a fun and happy topic for a Sunday morning, right? As a result of all this, it does make some sense that the Thessalonians and really all of us, their theological descendants, have some serious concerns about death. What about all those people who died before Jesus comes back? What about all those people who died before Jesus came the first time? You know, I, I never used to really worry or even think about those questions until I got a little bit older and started to understand some of the theological impacts of those questions and what their answers could be. Something else to consider why does death still seem to have such a sting if Christ won the final victory? I mean, there are lyrics in at least one or two of our hymns and several passages in Scripture that talk about death no longer having a sting. So why does death still have a sting, especially since Christ won Christ alone has that final word over life and death. Now, Paul, Paul spends a lot of time in his correspondence with the Thessalonians calling the believers to test what they hear before they receive it as truth. Paul was a lot of fun like that. I think he had too much time in his hands some days. But in his defense... Paul is very clear that there is much in this world and in the church that is good to the ear, but it's not necessarily good news. I want us to take a step back for a second here, because I think we could come up with some other things that kind of fit into this mold or this concept. We've just had Halloween recently, so let's use candy as an example. For many people, but not all, candy is good to our taste buds. And from what I've heard, dark chocolate's supposed to be good for your health. Um, I'm trying to prove that right, so. Um, but, again, from what I've been told, candy's really not that great for your teeth, your blood sugar, your waistline, and, and so on. So again, it's something that has this positive effect on first connection, in this case, our taste buds. But as we go further down the line with it, we realize it's maybe not quite so great after all. So in staying with this idea that Paul here is, is trying to impress upon the Thessalonian congregation that he's writing to, that there's so much in this world and in the church that is good to our ear but it's not necessarily good news. How does this line of thought or this presented reality from Paul function alongside or, or even within something like death? 
I actually believe that this idea is particularly true when it comes to death. You see, at the core of our Christian faith is a word about death. It is broken wide open for us on Easter Sunday. But it's also important to recognize that likewise, there is no other Christian doctrine that has been revised by the surrounding culture. I want you to think about that for a second. The Greeks and the Egyptians, they believed that the soul went on to some kind of afterlife. And even some of the Jews believed in a resurrection at the end of all time. So to simply say that, that Christians believe that there is something on the other side of death, it doesn't really express the Christian hope. For Christians, there is more to it than just something's coming later. The Christian approach to death must somehow paradoxically embrace the reality of human loss and also the hope of eternal life. Easy, right? We can go on. Take a look at some of our funeral, litur funeral liturgies, for example. Many of you have probably been to enough funerals, or at least in the Methodist Church, that you probably could even recite some of the liturgy that you've heard without even thinking about it. But many of our liturgies begin with the announcement that we have come to praise God and acknowledge our human loss all at the same time. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But perhaps, perhaps this is exactly what Paul means when talking about grieving with hope. Paul never suggests that faith somehow exempts us from the need to grieve. Not at all. Christians know full well the pain of death, even death on a cross. Grieving with hope will always mean acknowledging our loss and taking seriously the sadness of others around us, while at the same time trusting that a larger epic is still unfolding even if we can't see it or we struggle to see it. Just because we are Christians does not mean we don't need to mourn or we shouldn't mourn. It's part of being human. When I was in seminary, there was a colleague of mine who, while doing her seminary work, was also pastoring a church in northern Wisconsin. And she had a member of her congregation whose son was suffering from cystic fibrosis. Now, if you're not familiar with cystic fibrosis, which I have heard that term, but it wasn't until I started actually digging into, I really begin to understand what it is. It's this inherited life-threatening disorder that damages the lungs and often the digestive system for those who suffer from it. Cystic fibrosis affects all those cells in your body that do things like produce mucus and sweat and digestive juices. And essentially what happens, and this is probably simplifying it, so for all of, all of the nurses in here, please you know, forgive my simplification of this, but all of those fluids start to get really thick and kind of sticky. And those fluids start to plug up the tubes and the ducts and the passageways within your body. And that blockage, all that clogging, can lead to things like malnutrition, poor growth, respiratory infections, breathing problems, and chronic lung disease, and I'm sure several other things. Now, as someone who comes from a family with a long history of asthma and who suffers from it myself, I am beyond thankful that cystic fibrosis does not appear in my family line, at least so far. Asthma can be hard enough to control and live with for many people. I can't even begin to fully wrap my head around the challenges of what cystic fibrosis can do to you and to your body. And it is still considered somewhat of a rare disorder 
because typically there are fewer than 200,000 cases in the United States each year, which I'm sorry, 200,000? While it might be rare based on the population statistics, that's still a lot of people. And it can only be treated. This is not a condition that yet, what, yet which we have a cure. So back to this woman and, and her son. As the son was laying in his hospital bed in his final days, his mother asked him if she could read him some scripture to try and comfort him a little bit. And in talking with my colleague later on who was sharing the story with me, she had mentioned how the, the mom was, she wasn't sure what to read. What would comfort him? What would make sense to him? What would actually do something for him in the reality that his time was coming to close. And I guess in that hospital room, her son, despite being young, kind of noticed the hesitation in her. And he said, Mom, could you turn to page 1,649 in your Bible and read something from there? Now, before you ask, there was a reason he asked for that page number. And I did open several Bibles just to see if there was a correlation between them, and of course there isn't. But he asked for that because his two favorite numbers were 16 and 49. 16 being the jersey number of NFL legend Joe Montana, one of his favorite football players, who played for the 49ers for a good part of his career. And so those numbers meaning something to him, that's what he offered. So not really quite the Da Vinci Code here, but... I thought still pretty creative. So his mom flips open her Bible, but it, end, it ended at page 1,334. The reason being that this particular printing of the Bible started at page one in the Old Testament, and when they got to the beginning of the New Testament, started over again at page one. So now she's stuck in her head thinking, okay, now what? I, I was already struggling, he came up with something that had meaning for him, and now I've got nothing again. But thankfully, she was a pretty quick thinker, and she did the math to figure out, go through the Old Testament, and then how many more pages in the New Testament to equal 1,649 pages, which comes out to page 315 in the New Testament in this Bible. So she goes to that page, and she finds these words from the Apostle Paul, to the Thessalonian church. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Somebody's guardian angel was working overtime that day and got an A plus, I think. Upon hearing those words, this young boy turned to his mother, was his CO2 level is rising, his lungs are failing him, and he says, Mommy, those are the sweetest verses. Talk about out of the mouths of babes. I can only pray that when my time comes and God is calling me home, that I would have that kind of clarity, that strength of faith to be able to hear scripture words like that and come to that same conclusion that this young boy did. The truth is we live in the shadow of death, but it is also true that we wait for the dawn, a dawn that we know is coming. We grieve, but not as others do, because we are a people of hope. We are resurrection people. We are cherished siblings of Jesus Christ, beloved children of God, made in God's image, recipients of God's perfect love and grace, and we hold a hope that is beyond the reach or the power of death, or that death may try and hold over us. We know that Jesus and he alone holds that final word over life and death. That's the kind of hope that can help people get through some of the toughest times in their lives. 
It won't make them necessarily less tough, but it's the kind of hope that can help you get through it. And I pray that as you go about your daily life, as you come across other people who are grieving or mourning for a loss in their life, whether it be a loved one or a relationship or whatever it might be, I pray that you feel the pull to share that hope, to let them know that there is more to come. There is a life to come after death. There is a greatness, a paradise waiting for us. We may not know exactly what it looks like. There's been debate about that forever. But we have that hope because of Jesus Christ. So I pray that you are able to share it in whatever way is appropriate, in whatever way you're comfortable, in whatever way that person might be comfortable in receiving it. Because that's the hope that gets us through not just really the tough times, but through every day until we are called home. Amen. I invite you to rise for our closing hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. Cherished siblings of our Savior Jesus Christ and beloved children of God, keep awake for Christ is coming to gather us to his welcome table where we will feast in joy. May the grace of Christ surround you, the love of God uphold you, and the Holy Spirit spark you with unquenchable fire as you wait and work for the kingdom to come. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.